I'm Deb Whitman, Director of the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Welcome to our session on organic growth and funding the creation and scaling of companies through paths other than venture capital. To start this session, I'd like to introduce you to a remarkable entrepreneur, Ricardo Cervantes. Ricardo is the co-founder and CEO of La Monarca Bakery, a chain of Hispanic bakeries in the Los Angeles area. I've heard Ricardo speak before about how important it is to him to have his bakeries play a role and have a positive impact in the local LA communities. But it doesn't stop there. The company's logo features the monarch butterfly and Ricardo manages to extend the firm's impact beyond Los Angeles by serving on the board of Ecolife Conservation, an environmental organization with programs that protect the monarch in Mexico as well as help to improve the health of the human population in the regions of Mexico where the monarch lives. So please join me in welcoming Ricardo Cervantes to lead our conversation about organically growing a business. Welcome, Ricardo. Thank you, Deb. Uh, honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, well, uh, as Deb mentioned, we have a very good panel today uh, with the title, uh, Building a Company Old School, kind of organic growth the non-VC way, uh, kind of to give another flavor, other options, uh, maybe even other motivations of founders to start and run their companies. Uh, as Deb mentioned, I'm the CEO, founder of La Monarca Bakery. Uh, we have 12 stores in the LA area and our company's mission is to bake delicious products with the sweet flavor of Mexico while creating opportunities in underserved communities and caring for our environment. Um, so we have three phenomenal panelists today, which we'll get to hear from uh, very quickly. Uh, just the rules of the road today, it will be 30 minutes in all. Uh, we will give the panelists a, a chance to introduce themselves and their companies uh, to start. And then we will dive into three questions. Uh, how did they get the money to start their business? Uh, second, how are they currently growing their company and funding that growth? And the third one, kind of the competitive, the competitive advantages they see of being a private non-VC firm and also perhaps some competitive advantages they believe they have or had because of their own background, culture, race, ethnicity, in their current work and industry, what, what has helped them be successful. So without further ado, we will start with the panelists' introductions and we will start with Jessica Norwood, a founder of Runway. Go for it, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you so much, Deb, and everyone uh, for inviting me to be a part of this really incredible panel and old school, right, Ricardo? Old school <laughs> way of, of financing our business, really the real way that we finance it. So my name is Jessica Norwood. I am the founder of Runway. I am from Alabama and I come from a long line of black women futurists, women who understood that the only way to get to black freedom was to invest in it. From fish fries in Montgomery to fashion shows in Harlem, black women funded the civil rights movement. And in this new movement of restorative finance, we are still here. Runway is a 100% black and brown woman led financial innovation firm focused on getting capital to black companies inside of a right relationship framework. So this is how I come to the work. I come as a black woman who has grown up seeing her people be deeply unloved, seeing really every manner of violence from stories and history of enslavement to prison to even murder in the streets. And despite every horror that I have seen, I still believe very deeply in a world where black people are loved. So I imagine a world that believes that we are all worthy enough to be restored, that we could come being in this particular situation where abuse and violence of people of color and of women to move from that and to find our way towards love. And so I know it sounds esoteric for a business conversation, but what does that look like for me? It means building financial infrastructure that loves black people. 
It means doing an overhaul on modern financial practices with an eye toward anti-racism and nonviolence. It means runway. When I started Runway four years ago, I had one question in mind. I wanted to know if we could in fact practice being friends and family. And you all have probably heard of what it means to get a friends and family round of money. That's the type of money when folks say, oh, you got a great idea. You should borrow money from your friends and your family. <laughs> and if you're black, you're looking around and you're like, what friends, what, what, <laughs> what's the, what family? But I wanted to know what it would look like for Black folks to experience receiving that kind of capital and not just the capital itself, but the support and care that comes with that, that says, I believe in you and every entrepreneur on this panel or listening understands how important it is to get that kind of money. So um, for Black people, getting that kind of money isn't really an easy kind of thing because of the racial systemic failures in finance. And the reality is without that kind of money, black firms struggle. Um, and worse, many ideas of African-American um, entrepreneurs never leave the napkin because their business networks don't have the capital to launch. So what we do at Runway is we provide a healing space inside of that. And I'll tell you why. The New York Federal Reserve released a report last, late last year that said 60% of black companies have closed inside of COVID and will not reopen. And you want to know why? They said that these firms had weaker financial cushions, weaker bank relationships, and pre-existing funding gaps prior to the pandemic. And I want to tell you that the only way that we change that is by being really deeply intentional about how we move capital to Black firms. And ultimately, when we get it right for Black firms, we get it right for everybody, that we practice being anti-racist, that we practice being anti-oppressive and cooperative in such a way that we build authentic relationships, that we shift power, and that we center the people and the places that have been on the other side of this generational economic violence. That's what we do at Runway, and I am honored to be a part of this panel. Thank you, Jessica. Love the passion. You started us off right. Uh, that's fantastic. Our second panelist, Arturo Lomeli, dear friend, eh, founder, Clase Azul Tequila. Go for it, Arturo. Um, thank you, everybody, to be here hearing um, a story of uh, overnight success of 24 years, right? 24 years doing something that when we start was totally out of the box. We create a tall bottle of tequila, uh, expensive at the time. And <clears throat> when we start, I think we were very naive, but we've been also very stubborn. And one thing takes to another, and now we are a company who sells in 44 countries. Uh, maybe you don't recognize the name Tequila Clase Azul, but it's the iconic ceramic bottle uh, sit on most of the highest and most uh, renowned places in US, mostly in Europe and many other places. We have, uh, we integrate the whole uh, chain of value, meaning that we own the tequila uh, factories, the ceramic factories. We own the importing companies for US, also for Europe. Also, we just opened our office in Tokyo to have our importing company for all Asia markets. We control mostly the whole, uh, we said from, from, the, from the agaves to the lips. We are in, in every single aspects of the chain. Um, we are happy that our tequila, it's integrated, um, handcrafted uh, techniques from Mexico. We have a lot of uh, women's working with us, 70%. We are providing uh, daycares. We are providing uh, uh, back people back to the school. We are, in our company, we're trying to dignificate um, the, the job. Uh, one of the things that I learned when I moved to US 12 years ago was in US, there, is, there are no second chances, as Jessica has been saying. Uh, well, in Mexico, there are no chances. And we are creating a chance for, for Mexicans and we export it to all the, the world. And I'm happy to say that we have a, a really good tequila, Jessica, to toast for that fantastic um, <laughs> Um, thing that you are doing with all the fair and we we are as a company idealistics of the, the of the humanity um, uh, needs which is uh, 
care, justice, love, fraternity. We are in the same path. Thank you for having me here. Thank you, Arturo. Great introduction and, and uh, full disclosure, Arturo and I are, are friends from before. We're both part of the Talkboat Institute, which is a fabulous organization trying to uh, uh, build a relationships between privately owned businesses uh, and sustaining growing privately owned enterprises. So it's great to see you, Arturo. Uh, uh, it's been a little while. And our third panelist, Byron Allen. And Byron, I have to confess, uh, growing up in Mexico, uh, I remember seeing you in the 80s on NBC. And we had cable television in my parents' house. There were three channels, ABC, CBS, NBC. And I remember seeing you. And when I saw your bio on the panel, I'm like, I know him. I've seen him before. So mm -hmm. I'm very, how life comes full circle sometimes. So I'm very excited that you're here as well. And uh, Byron Allen, uh, founder, CEO of Entertainment Studios. Go for it, Byron. Well, first of all, Ricardo, thank you for having me. And uh, that is, that's such a delight to hear. Uh, you were in diapers when I was on NBC. Uh, that, was, uh, that was many years ago, young man. That was uh, 1979 to 1984. So uh, you were definitely walking around in diapers. But I thank you for watching uh, all the way from beautiful Mexico City. So I really appreciate that. Um, listen. Uh, I, uh, I started my company uh, in uh, 93, in 1993 from my dining room table. And uh, I started my company uh, because I really wanted to really understand the most important word in show business, which is the word business. A lot of people want to be in show business, but they focus too much on the show side. And uh, I, I realized it's not show business, it's business show. And I was very fortunate to learn that early on. Um, you know, I come by way of starting as a stand-up comedian and I was very fortunate uh, to have that opportunity. My mother uh, got pregnant with me when she was uh, 16 years old. And she had me 17 days after her 17th birthday. So I tell everybody I have at least two high school degrees. And uh, my mother and father uh, got a divorce. And uh, summer of 68, uh, well, spring of 68, I was in Detroit, Michigan, and they, they murdered Martin Luther King. And the military took over our neighborhood and they went up in flames. And my mother and I decided to go to LA for a two week vacation. We ended up staying. And uh, I was really fortunate. Not only is my mother beautiful, she happens to be brilliant. And as a single mother, she ended up going back to, she ended up going to UCLA and getting her master's degree in cinema TV production. And because she was at UCLA working on her master's degree, and that just shows you education is everything. It opened up a paradigm for us that did not exist. So Stanford University is changing lives for the better, USC, UCLA, all of these amazing schools. And because she was at UCLA, she was able to go to NBC and ask for a job. And they said, no, we don't have a job for you. And then she asked, do they have an intern program? And they said, no, we do not. She said, is there an intern program where I could work for free? Do you have one? They said, no. And then she asked a question that changed our lives forever. She said, will you start one with me? And thank God they said, yes. And it was there that I was exposed to how you make television. And I would, as a kid, waiting for my mother to get off work, uh, I would go from studio to studio to studio because she obviously could not afford childcare. So her child had to hang out in the corners and watch them make TV. So I would watch Johnny Carson make his television show. And then I would go across the hall and watch Flip Wilson do his show. And then I go across the hall and I watch Red Fox do Sanford and Son and Freddie Prince do Chico and the Man and Bob Hope do his specials and George Burns do his specials. And I thought what a wonderful way to go through life making people laugh and producing content. So education is very powerful. Exposure, mentorship is very powerful because that's what I was exposed to. And I started performing at a young age, stand-up comedy because of watching Johnny Carson and Red Fox firsthand and them talking to me like I was their long lost friend. And I ended up being the youngest comedian to do The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And that got me a number of offers. And one of them was real people. So that's how we ended up there. I was 18. And I used to write jokes for Jimmy Walker, uh, along with David Letterman, 
who was who had just driven out from Indianapolis and Jay Leno, who was sleeping in his car. And we, they made 200 bucks a week and I got 25 bucks a joke. And I started my own company from my dining room table. And I started by calling every television station in the country and asking them to carry my once a week, one hour television show. And I literally called all 1300 television stations from sun up to sundown for a year. And on average, every television station told me no. And after I went through about 50,000 no's, I was able to squeeze out about 150 yeses. And my pitch was really simple. I would interview seven movie stars per week and I would keep seven minutes of commercial time. You keep seven minutes of commercial time. I will sell my seven minutes to national advertisers. You sell your seven minutes to local advertisers, local banks, supermarkets, and car dealers. And it was very hard. And I eventually got the show up and running. No one wanted to sell my advertising time and no one wanted to buy my advertising time. So to fund production, which I didn't have the money to do and I did not have access to capital to raise money to do it. My home went in and out of foreclosure probably 14 times over about a five year period. There were days I didn't eat. They were, there were days they turned off my phone and I had to call people from a pay phone. This is before we had mobile phones. And I just kept smiling and dialing and dialing and smiling. And the next thing you know, almost 30 years later, I ended up with over 65 television shows on the air, over 5,000 hours of content, one of the largest privately held media companies in the world, a portfolio of 12 television networks, including the Weather Channel and a streaming service called Local Now. And I own the company 100% not by design, but because I am black. And when you're black in America or brown or Hispanic, you don't have access to capital. But I didn't know that when I started the company from my dining room table, I did not have access to capital. As a matter of fact, the only capital I had access to was predatory capital. I couldn't afford to wait for corporations to pay me 120, 180 days after I ran their spots. I had to go to factors and these factors would charge me 26, 27% interest. The miracle of my company is that I survived paying 26, 27% interest on receivables from the biggest corporations in the world. I built and, I built and collected over $500 million, over a half a billion dollars that never, not one penny, went bad. Not one penny did we not collect. But yet I paid 26% interest. That was the miracle. But I kept smiling and dialing. And what I will say is me being black was my blessing, not my curse. Because what happened was, it, the best way I can describe it, you can send two people to the gym. And if one of them only has to bench press 50 pounds, and the other one has to bench press 5,000 pounds and things get a little rough, which one's gonna keep standing? And I feel like my white colleagues, my white counterparts, they had a disservice. They didn't have enough pressure against them. They didn't have enough resistance against them. I had to do it with absolute sheer muscle and might and will because no economic inclusion whatsoever. And for that, I'm grateful because I've built a foundation now and our company continues to grow because we are our own bank. We finance ourselves. Business. And you have, to, you, have to, you have to now have your margins that they're healthy. And I say, I don't go to Bank of America. I go to Bank of Byron. <laughs> because I, and, and, by, bank of, because, and I watch my grandfather do that. He built his business. And you know something? A lot of Black and Hispanic people, are the greatest entrepreneurs because guess what? You're not given jobs. You're not given opportunities. I grew up, everybody around me had to start a business, even if it was one or two employees to pay for their families. And it was really interesting, LegalZoom said to me, we really are targeting African-Americans and Latinos. I go, why is that? They go, because they are the entrepreneurs and they start companies because of self-employment. Yes. And I didn't even know I was falling in that and that's what happened. 
So that's my journey. Uh, I love what I do. And last but not least, media matters because media is what you go to. And that's important on how you see us, how you're produced, how you're depicted, how the world values you. I've let white owned media companies produce me and they'll do talk shows where I'm dancing and saying, look at the DNA, thank God I'm not the baby daddy. But when I take my resources, I give you five court shows, an African-American male, Judge Ross, three African-American females, Judge Maybelline, Judge Hatchett, Judge Karen, and one Latina, Judge Christina Perez, who's won five Emmys. I give you black and brown people five hours a day as legal scholars. That's why it's important to have a seat at the table when it comes to media and funding yourself 100% because you're completely unfiltered and you are off the plantation. You are your own person. What a fantastic story, Byron. And I, 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 I had read some of, uh, of your bio and, and just as fascinating and hats off to you. And you nailed it in the part about why do Hispanics start businesses? And it really is about the self-employment. And what a great segue, I say, Jessica, and then we'll go to you, Arturo. I think just for time keeps, I think we have like 15 minutes. Byron gave us the blueprint of Jessica, what, how to hit the three questions. Byron mentioned he didn't have any money, so he had to factor his way to start his business at 27%. That's incredible. And then, of course, how he's grown and the channels and the networks and the programming. And so my question to you, Jessica, very to condense those three and, and, and let's do about a five minute max. And I'll do a thumbs up just to get Arturo in then at the end, basically hitting those three. So how did you start Runway? Who gave you the money to do it? And then, of course, how do you fund entrepreneurs? Maybe you would have lent money to Byron at a much lower rate. He would have been much better off. And then, of course, how have you grown runway? Because your resources are very capital intensive. You literally need money. No? So how, how are you looking to grow runway and get more capital for your organization? So go yeah. for it. Okay. Okay, chef. All right. So Byron, I would have been your person. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and hopefully, you know, for everybody who has an, a, a story quite like that one, and there's so, so many of them. I, I got started, um, as I mentioned, I'm a storyteller, uh, so forgive me, but I got started in Alabama, as I mentioned, and it was an older man by the name of Mr. Roberts, uh, was 84 years old. At the time that I met him, I had a grant from the Ford Foundation to look at uh, black wealth and land in particular. And I was looking at making investments along the value chain of their supply chain to increase wealth. So we're always looking at financial innovations and strategies. And this, this man, 84 years old, I remember very distinctly that he was um, had very compact muscles, very strong. And he, he had been working his whole life in farming in the Alabama Black Belt. And, um, um, and, and, and the importance of this particular uh, piece that I'm mentioning is, is that this is really how the wealth gap grows. So this, this through line between why there was no capital when you get started and you couldn't borrow money from your friends and family has been a historic um, issue because we've stolen and taken a lot of land and other assets that we would use to build wealth. So this was one of those things. Uh, freed Black people had uh, land about 20 million acres right after the Civil War. Um, today, that's probably about 2 million acres and systemically it, this has been uh, eroding because of access to capital. So Mr. Roberts grew up as a sharecropper um, and he was in debt in a very particular way to the people whose land he lived on when the owner passed away he um, decided that he would make an opportunity for himself. And so he, he went to the, the, the children of that owner and said, you know, I think that I'd like to buy the parcel of land that I have been working for my whole life. And um, he thought that he could sell goods, he could do ins and outs of jobs and different things like that, and he would um, be able to make the payments. And the children agreed. They thought, you know, they're living in Birmingham at this point, they're living in Atlanta, this is fine um, to, to, to do this. And so they 
sent him over to the neighboring county in Alabama, to Wilcox County, to talk with a banker over there. And he goes and he meets with this banker and they work out payments. And, you know, he's smart enough, astute enough to know that he's got to keep his own ledger about what these payments are about. And so he's writing it down. And for 15 years, he goes back and forth to this bank and he makes payments. And at the end of this, he goes in and he's got his ledger in hand and he says, oh, I'm here for the deed or what he called his ownership papers because he owned that land and he wanted the paperwork that said it. And the banker told him to come back the next day. He came back again, he goes on and this banker looks at him and says, boy, if you don't get out of here. And he runs them off. Now, he understood at that point as a black man with limited education, uh, limited resources, there was nothing in Wilcox County, Alabama at that point in his life that he would be able to do about it. And it made him distrust any kind of lending that we were going to be able to do. There was a cultural piece underneath inside of this that it wasn't just, it wasn't just about the money. People tell me all the time, oh, we've got so much money available to loan to black businesses. And then they ask me, what is it that you do that's different? And I asked them, how many, how many loans have you closed? How quickly have you closed them to Byron's point? You, you've got these companies waiting and waiting and waiting for capital and they're dying on the vine. We close in 30 days because we understand the problem and we understand how to solve it. So uh, for me, Mr. Roberts was one of those folks who quickly taught me a lot about the underlying systemic issues and the trauma wrapped inside of what it means to be trying to get access to this kind of capital and how whatever intervention couldn't just be about the money, right? It had to be about actually understanding the cultural and the, the, the inequity that was already baked inside of that system. And so one year later, I applied kind of on a whim. I don't think I've ever said that I applied on a whim, but now I'm going to say it because time has passed, but I can apply kind of on a whim. I was actually at another conference supposed to speak and there was some mishaps and I ended up going to a cafe and deciding I was going to submit a proposal uh, for a fellowship um, around the story I'd heard about Mr. Roberts and that I thought that there was a new way to do financing, that there was a way to really interject um, compassion and humanity inside of the underwriting, that there were things that I would approach very differently that could have gotten Mr. Roberts and other people and Byron and everybody here, the money that they needed early on because they have the experience, they have the relationship and they knew what they were doing. Uh, and so I used my prize money. I won a very big fellowship and I used my prize money and invested it in uh, the company that is now Runway. Oh. And we now make loans uh, to black and brown companies in Oakland and Boston and other places uh, from the pre-seed all the way into uh, growth capital. What a fantastic, again, from factoring to prize money. And then I've heard a couple of things. You both mentioned something that I think it's a great takeaway. Byron, I loved how you said my mother then asked the question, would you start one with me? And then Jessica, you said, I applied on a, did you say whim? I don't know the word, you, but so kind of just getting yourself out there, I, I would take as a, as, 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 as a great takeaway. And, and I think Arturo has a cup of coffee, but that's really tequila. So <laughs> I'll go to him now before he drinks that entire cup. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> So Arturo, uh, so to say you started a tequila business maybe makes people seem like, oh, all he needed was like a, an agave plant, a stove and a bottle. No, but how does that get going? How did you start Glacia Azul, which is a phenomenal brand, uh, but how did you start? And, 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 and so how'd you get the money? And then of course, how you've grown and, and, and if you kind of share the same path as Jessica, and Byron just shared. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Ricardo. I, I like what uh, Byron said about the, the show business, right? The, the show business has to be business. Same as tequila. The tequila is something that you see at the bar and it, it seems sexy. So you want to get into a sexy industries and it's as hard as any other. And the margins and all the structure, it's, it's complicated. But when we start, and um, Jessica forget, forgot uh, to mention that the other F is not just friend and family. So we start with friends, family, and fools, right? You have to have the third F, <clears throat> sorry, the third F in order to 
um, start. Basically, we get the money at the start from my father, which it was a little amount. We had good margins. We've been lucky. Uh, the, the industry that we were in was growing. We didn't know that the, the tequila, the premium tequila or the luxury tequila was going to be the next big thing when we started in 1997. Nobody knew that. Uh, and we've been lucky and we've been, we've been out there. Um, how do we deal with the cash flow? Well, I learned that cash flow is more important than your mother, right? So you have to be busy, you have to be positive, and you had to be, you had to take action of the things that matter. I remember in, in the biggest crisis that our company went through was not the economic crisis, was the, the human or, or the talent crisis. And we realized that the people that we had in our company were, was not our biggest asset. Uh, and, we, and we turn that into have the best people as our biggest asset. And them or they give us a chance to start seeing how to maximize our profits, how to reduce our waste, how to uh, find a, a better um, way of working in order to save. Because when you are growing, we've been growing 100% for the last seven years. And the best partner that I had in my life was the banks, but the banks were closed for the first 15 years. Now, I remember all those banks who say, no, you're crazy. You are never going to make with that uh, business model. So we cannot afford to lend you money. And there, there was one bank who gave us the chance. And now that bank is founding every single thing that we do, we're expanding expanding to hospitality, we're expanding to our own retail, we're expanding, we're launching a new bottle every three, every three months. So them are really uh, uh, blessed for us. And the line of other banks now are knocking the door and saying, please, we can give you the money now. And I said, thank you, we don't need it. And the advantage to be private is it's amazing. As, as Byron, as, as Jessica have been saying, you are following your intuition and you are doing the right things. If you get a into uh, uh, an investment bankers or, or hedge funds, there are certain things that they never gonna allow you to do as a, as a founder or, or as a CEO, CEO. They're never gonna allow you to give uh, money to uh, foundations or they're never going to understand the will to really help others. And they're never going to give you the chance to explore and, and make some experimentations outside of the of the uh, positive PNL. So I think to be private, it's a, a, a unique bless. And Byron, Jessica, I am blessed and I am honored to be part of this panel, same as you, Ricardo, where, where we are not seeing our business to have the goal of making money. Money, making money is just a tool. The tool that we are using to change the world. What a fantastic way to, to... To summarize, and 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 I, I wish this panel. I'm I'm just in awe of all three of you, and I wish we had another couple hours, or or even just get together, uh, with a bottle of Clase Azul to just share stories. I want to I, I want to say something where, where Carlo I think is really important as it relates to Stanford, and this yes. is something that everybody should know, and it's what Arturo and 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 Jessica have been speaking about. I bought the rights at one point to uh, Coretta Scott King's Jr.'s uh, book, uh, My Life with Martin. I wanted to look at the world's greatest love story. I wanted to look at Martin Luther King through her eyes. And she said to me, Byron, as black people in America, we've had four major challenges. Number one, end slavery. Number two, end Jim Crow, which was more damaging than slavery. That, that was lynch them, murder them, incarcerate them, on and on, genocide against Black people, which is still on today. Number three, achieve civil rights. And then she said something, we like, she started to choke up, and it changed my life forever. She said, and number four, the real reason they killed my Martin, achieve economic inclusion. She said, Byron, they didn't kill my Martin over the speech, I have a dream. They killed him over the speech, the other America, the speech he gave at Stanford University, where he stood on that stage and he said, there are two Americas. 
One America has opportunity, has access to an education, capital, jobs, mentorship, businesses. Two Americas will not survive. We need to achieve one America. The other America will not work. And as we come out as entrepreneurs and we take that economic inclusion that's been denied us, it's making America better. It's creating that one America that we must achieve or else America will not survive. And if we achieve one America here, then we will be an example to achieve one planet. And once we achieve one planet, then we will actually achieve a slice of heaven here on planet earth. And Martin Luther King taught us that over 50 years ago on a stage right there at Stanford University. And I challenge everybody to go on YouTube and watch that speech, you should know it. One America, that's what we must achieve. And to Arturo's point, you're able to do that through business, through business. Yes. Ownership, Look, equity. Could, could not agree more. And that's a phenomenal point. And, and I think a private enterprise for so many years, and I say centuries even here in the United States, were truly the, the pillars of their own communities. No, it was the, 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 the hospitals, the sports teams, the schools, everything was funded by private enterprise. And unfortunately, as Arturo very well said, most of the growth companies today are not privately owned, so they cannot invest in these things, which then creates these bigger and bigger and bigger chasms. And so that is one of the strengths of being a private enterprise that you can still look at your community and build it as part of your mission that you are going to make it better. Um, so I think we have like three minutes, four minutes before a Q&A session. Again, I'm, I'm so bummed. I'm like in awe of, of this panelists and, and everything you, you've said. But so very quickly to close and, and, and to close and then open it to questions and people can send questions in the Q&A uh, uh, button at below your screen. But I would like to say, and Byron, you mentioned this. I always like to close on, a, let's say on a positive and, and, and you said something that was extremely insightful. There, of course, have been inequities that we all talked about and we maybe have lived ourselves as, as, as Jessica said, as black and brown folks. But what are some of the positives? And you said it very well, like you had to lift the 5,000 pounds. Yes. So, so, so what have been, and, and, and you said, and I don't know that, I think you, you nailed it with that one, but so that was my final question for each of you. If you like one minute, what has been something from your background specifically, and you said, Byron, I had to live the 5,000 pounds and I'll stay with you. What is something that you tell others, entrepreneurs, whether they're minorities or not, but I, I say more, let's say from black and brown, which is what we are from, hey, don't pity yourself. These are some advantages that you have yes. that others don't have. So how would, in one minute, what would be something to motivate that real you would tell someone? I mean, real simple. To have long-term sustainable success, you need resistance. That resistance is a key ingredient for your success. Thank you for the resistance, all the no's, all the lack of access to capital. You made me better. You made it tougher but you made me better. You made me unstoppable. There's no one that can beat me. The reason you can't beat me is because of all of the resistance. I had to build it brick by brick. I had to build a foundation that no one else has ever had to build. I know it innately. I'm an owner. Most of the time I'm against temporary hired help. Temporary hired help will never be an owner. If you get in the ring with me, I'll let you go two rounds just to entertain the crowd. But I don't even need to let you go two rounds. <laughs> you can't beat me because I had to build it. And, and I love the fact that like now in terms of financing, I had to learn financing. Every banker in the world is at my door looking to do business with me to buy. We, I've invested almost you know, over $500 million buying big four network affiliates because they come to me and they offer me the capital. And I take it at terms that are not predatory because you know why they trust having their money with me? Because they know that I am an entrepreneurial athlete 
that they make a lot of money with. I had a guy come to me. He gave me 310 million to buy the Weather Channel. He gave me five years to pay it back. I gave it back to him in five months, plus a $30 million prepayment, almost a $30 million prepayment penalty. I, I got a prepayment penalty for paying it back fast. I said, no problem. I gave him the 310 million back plus a $30 million prepayment to show Wall Street, if you want to make money, you call me. After I did that, literally Wall Street said, here's $10 billion, what do you want to buy? Because I proved myself. That's what they do when they push back on you. They make you excellent. They make you brilliant. They make you unstoppable. They make you the best. And you know what they have? They have a capital deployment problem. There's over 20 trillion in the system, but you know, capital is not the commodity. The great entrepreneur is the commodity. There aren't that many great entrepreneurs you can put your capital with to protect it. Your money is not special. I'm special. Now, if you want to keep your money and you want to make more money, you need to be with an entrepreneur like me. I'm special. Your money's not special. There's over 20 trillion. I have term sheets on my desk. I pick who I want to be in business with. You want that pushback. That's you in the gym. That's you training to go a thousand rounds. That means nobody can ever beat you, ever. It's impossible. I, and when you love what you do, it shows. Fantastic. Jessica, yeah, take it, yeah. go with it. Right, I would, I would say, you know, the, the positive inside of this all, um, uh, the advantage that we have, um, really for me is I'm a black woman. I mean, what's better than that? Um, but we, we have a dual understanding of racism and patriarchy. And let me tell you something. I, I know I keep harping on this, but I wanna be very clear. There is business inside of repair. That's why I'm here. There is business in actually being good to people. Imagine who you would really be if you actually came correct who you would be inside and what impact you would really have. Not just the financial return, but also the social impact return. There is business inside of repair. And I want you to look around everybody right now and do an audit of what is going on in the world outside of you. And I want you to ask yourself, do you need repair? Because if your answer is yes, then the advantage is talk to someone who understands it. Talk to someone who actually has lived it. Talk to someone who actually knows how to get a real solution. Not just shuffling money or shuffling the chairs on the deck. Talk to somebody who knows how to do it and has a proven track record. 100% of our businesses are still open, still running, still thriving. We're still moving money. And that's because we know that there is a through line between killing a man's dreams and killing a man in the street for a fake $20 bill. We understand the difference. We understand the through line between that level of violence is also the same kind of economic violence that happens. And so our strategic advantage is if you want to stop that kind of violence, if you want to get on the other side of that, you've got to talk to a black woman, somebody who understands the intersectionality, right? I love that we've lifted up Coretta, Soror Coretta, uh, Scott King's uh, name inside of this because it's true that the real work here is that economic inclusion, but it has to be done with the understanding of a divine feminine, something that we all have inside of us that actually asks us to return to humanity, to return to the balance between the planet between the people and between our profits. It has to happen in that way. We can't continue with the same thrust. So what I think is with the best part about all of this and the welcoming side of all of this is that there are people who are ready to work. I'm ready to work. Byron, Arturo, <laughs> Ricardo, I'm ready to work all we're the time, ready. right? So we're the, ready. The, we're ready. We're ready to go. the most important we're thing ready. is to hold the system in, in, in 30 seconds, hold the system accountable. The greatest trade deficit is in this country. And that's what I said to America. I was a supporter of President Barack Hussein Obama. And then I also became a critic because I said to President Obama, I need you to do two things. 
Number one, I need you to audit the banks and see if they're lending money to black people. And you will see that they're not lending money. And that's why we can't get home loans and we can't get business loans. And I said, the other thing is, I said, the government, the United States government has a one, over a trillion dollars in government worker pension fund money funded by black, brown people, black and brown people and women over a trillion dollars, not one penny of it managed by black people, by brown people, by women. It's all managed by white guys who pass it back and forth amongst themselves. And I said to him, I need you to only do two things, audit the banks and see if people can get bank loans. And the second thing is take at least 15% of that trillion dollars and put it in the hands of African-American money managers to make sure it's invested in African-American entrepreneurs. Take another 15% and put it with Latinos so it can be invested with Asian people, with women, and make sure that one plus trillion dollars of government worker pension fund money is going to the people who paid into it. And then when he didn't do it, that's when I started started to criticize them because politicians work for us. They're nothing more than temporary hired help. So you need to make sure corporate America is doing business with you, black and brown America, the way you're doing business with them. The greatest trade deficit in America is the trade deficit between corporate, white corporate America and black and brown America. And if you close that gap, you will see an end to economic genocide. Wow. And that economic, that economic genocide is what's creating this imbalance that where you see that when you don't have economic inclusion in America and you don't have, you know, you don't have an education in America and you don't have equal justice in America, they treat you like a stray dog in a foreign country. They will choke you to death in front of the world and think nothing of it. And the only way to stop that is you must address those E's, education, economic inclusion, and equal justice. And that's how you get one America and you get one human planet. Byron, you deserve I, that. I think a professorship just opened up at Stanford and they're gonna call you for it. And I'm sure Deb is gonna hit you up. Well, it's get... those kids at Stanford that will do this. That, yes. The reason I take my time to talk to them is it's because fantastic. they will do this. They are the ones who understand we must achieve balance. One America, one planet is a slice of heaven on planet Earth. We have that. That is it. our test, to love one another, to be there for one another, to help you. Your success is my success. Because you succeed, you sell, you buy more cars. You buy more cars, I get more car advertising. I, I need you to succeed. I'm sorry, we're, we're almost out of time. We're having to close this amazing session. Arturo, my friend, who else can sell us tequila better than you? <laughs> well, I, I, will, I will say- Close first, it, uh, 20 uh, seconds. Uh, yeah, I will say Byron for president. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I love being an entrepreneur, but I just want this world to be great. Wonderful. I'm agree, I'm agree that there is much more money in the world than good projects. So never allow small minds to convince you that your dreams are too big. Yes, that's right. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this panel as much as I did. I uh, thank our panelists, Jessica, Arturo, and Byron. What an amazing panel full of wisdom, full of inspirational stories. I hope you are as pumped up as I am to continue with the rest of my day. And Deb, we take it on to you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.